guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ's faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, I pray not only for these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them even as you loved me. Father, they are your gift to me. I wish that where I am they also may be with me, that they may see my glory that you gave me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world also does not know you, but I know you and they know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the most beautiful things in the liturgical year is on the vigil of Holy Saturday when the priest blesses the Paschal candle. So, and he lights that candle from the holy fire that's kindled, and we carry that candle into the darkened church to begin the great vigil of Easter. And we sing that Christ is our light. And so Christ is the light of the world, and the light that shines in the world dispels darkness. So wherever the church is, darkness is dispelled. And so we take great comfort from the fact that God has given us this church, to make our life full of light, and to give us the promise of eternal life. The church has no other light than Christ. According to a favorite image of the church fathers, the church is like the moon. All its light is reflected from the sun. So we see in the fact that the church as an instrument of God's grace reflects the light of the sun. And in English, that is a nice comparison. The sun that is a celestial body and then the sun that is um, uh, the, the son of the Father. This same sun um, is reflected in the life of the church. And that's our work as Christians too, to reflect the life of Christ through our participation in the church. Many people uh, ask, what does the word church mean? The word church is probably one of the most misunderstood terms, uh, certainly among different types of Christians. But in the Roman Catholic Church, we understand um, what the word church means on several levels, certainly by going back to look at the uh, early words that were used to describe the church. In the Greek language, we see the word ekklesia, which means really an assembly of those who are called out, called out from whatever it is they're doing to come together for a common purpose. We also see another word in Greek, which is uh, kuriakos, which is something that is of the Lord. Uh, so in um, most Latin languages, uh, Romance languages, we find derivatives of the word ecclesia, uh, as the common word for church. In Spanish, we have iglesia. In French, we have eglise. In Italian, we have chiesa. So all those come from ecclesia. 
In other languages, like German and English and uh, in some Celtic languages, we see the root in that kuriakos, the thing that is of the Lord, in the words kirka and in the English word church. But at the end of the day, it has to do with people who have come together for a common purpose, people who have a common belief. And so these are some of the ways in which we can describe, uh, begin to describe this great mystery of the church and what, does, what the word church really means. So when we talk about the church in, uh, in English, what does this word church mean? There are three meanings that we really can't separate from one another. One is simply the local community, the people in a certain place that gather together um, in, uh, in their parish church. And then we also understand that they gather together for a common purpose, which is liturgical worship. So in this local place, we gather together to worship God in the way he has ordained for us to worship, uh, through the sacraments and in the liturgy. But also, too, we can simply cannot move away from the fact that when the local church is together in the worshiping assembly, it is always connected to the universal church, the church that extends throughout the world, and the church that in one sense extends beyond this world in the kingdom of heaven uh, also too. The church is present in all these places. So we find the church in the local community, in the worshiping community, and in the universal community of believers. So I always think whenever you're trying to describe something, it's always wonderful to use images because that helps us all kind of um, really understand in a visual way uh, what it is that we're talking about. So the church has many different uh, images that are used to describe it uh, that are really found throughout scripture. One image that is used to describe the church is that of the sheepfold. So the shepherd prepares this special place in order to protect his sheep so that they will have good pasture, so they'll have everything that they need in order to flourish. The sheepfold, that's one image. Another image that we find is the image of an edifice, really a building that is built for God's purposes. We know that in the scriptures, uh, the imagery of the cornerstone is used uh, to refer to the Savior himself, and upon that cornerstone then is built uh, a wonderful building, a building built by God for his own purposes. We also find uh, in the scriptures a lot of imagery that has to do with the family. You know, how the family comes together as a unit of people who have a mutual bond, who protect one another, who reach out and care for one another, and the family then extends too through generations and generations um, uh, in many places. But the family always finds this common bond that keeps them united. We also find uh, images of the temple uh, which is interesting because there is a difference between a temple and a church. Uh, but the temple in the Old Testament was a place where God's presence was manifest. And so for us as Christians, his presence is manifest in many ways in the life of the church. It's also helpful when you're trying to describe something to know where it comes from. So we also uh, can address the question of what is the origin of the church? Where does the church come from? The church, uh, as the Catechism tells us, was a plan that was born in the Father's heart. So from the sin of our first parents, when they first stepped away from God's grace, the church became something important in the life of God's people because it is through the church that God has reached out to bring his people back to him, to give that grace that is needed for salvation, to be with him at peace in the kingdom, uh, uh, as we remember uh, the great peace and the harmony of the Garden of Eden. So this was a plan from our Lord's love for his people, born out of his love for his people. Uh, but the idea of the church has been there since the beginning of the world. Uh, early Christians stated that the world was created for the church to manifest God's love to us. It reminds me of what uh, St. Augustine said about um, the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, 
oh, happy fault, you know, the sin of Adam that brought about the redemption that we experienced from so wonderful a Savior. So the world really exists for the life of the church. And as I mentioned, the church is in heaven and on earth. So from the beginning of this created world, the Lord had in his mind that he would give us a church to bring us God's love. So this same church uh, is foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. We look throughout the uh, Hebrew scriptures and we find the church foreshadowed there. We see it foreshadowed in the fact that God called a certain people. He called the people of Israel, um, Abraham the patriarch. He called him to start uh, a people, a nation that he could call his own his special people, his chosen people. And then we see this nation flourish. We see this nation, too, that God protected and called out of slavery in Egypt. And it's interesting that in Hebrew, the word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, which is the land of darkness. So in a very real way, God brought his church, his people, his beloved, out of the land of darkness into a kingdom of light, which is another uh, liturgical formulation we use in the church, in our prayer. So we are here as a people that has, uh, as a people, as a church, from a plan that was formed in the Father's heart, but also too something that was foreshadowed um, throughout the Old Testament. We can just read time and time again where the Lord gathers his people together in a special way. But then of course this church is instituted by Christ Jesus himself. It's Christ Jesus that really, uh, as Messiah, comes to usher in um, the fullness of this church, this assembly, this group of the chosen. Um, and so I always think it's precious, the idea that we are his little flock. You know, we is a church extended throughout the whole world, more than a billion followers. We still retain this essential character of Christ's little flock. He is the good shepherd. And the shepherd is the one who has gathered his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. They know him. And in this relationship, we find the church. So where does the church come from? It comes out of God's love and his desire to be in relationship with his people. We see that in the Old Testament, and we see it in the way that Jesus manifests uh, himself as the Son of God in the midst of his people here on earth. So we ask ourselves then, what is the mission of the church? Um, there was a good priest in the seminary, it was our academic dean, who often used to say that uh, the church doesn't have a mission, the mission has a church. And I think that's an important formulation for us to keep in mind. The mission is to bring all people to a knowledge and understanding of God's love through his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. The missionary impulse of the church to reach out so that the word, which brings life and light, can be um, received by all people. This is the mission of the church. And when I say that the word is to be proclaimed, in the proclamation of the word, in the celebration of the sacraments, in the acts of charity from the members of the church, Christ is made present. So the mission of the church is to make Christ present in whatever way it can wherever it can. This is the call of all the members of the church. Again, as I mentioned, the missionary impulse. So together, we understand that the mission of the church is to make Christ present in the world in which we live so that when Christ comes again in glory, when he comes again to reconcile all things, that we are ready, we are prepared, that we have been faithful stewards of what he's given us in his teachings, so that we can present to him um, a world and um, the life of the church that is pleasing to him. The church is understood to be a mystery because it's something that transcends time and space. It's something that makes uh, an idea that is invisible. It makes the idea of God's love uh, not so remote. 
it makes it present to us in the world in which we live. So in this way, the church is a mystery. It makes spiritual realities visible to us. And for us as a Catholic people, this is very important. This has to do with the doctrine, uh, the beautiful um, gift of the incarnation, that the eternal Son of God, who existed from the foundation of the world, um, that he has come into the world to be like us in all things but sin, that our God entered into the world to be like us. He entered into time, into history, into a place, into a family, so that we might understand that we have access to these transcendent realities of grace that the Lord means for his people. So uh, we know that the church transcends all these things. So it has a mysterious quality uh, in the best sense of the term uh, because it is something that bridges the visible and the invisible. The church is also understood uh, in the mysterious uh, idea of nuptial union. You know, there was a young man one time who came to me and he wanted to talk to me because as a self-avowed atheist, he wanted to um, find out what I could tell him so that he could make this Catholic girl like him. He wanted to make sure that she liked him. He was attracted to her and he came to the priest to find out what he needed to know about the Catholic Church to make this girl like him. And in the course of the conversation, he said to me, he said, you know, um, I don't have any religion. My parents didn't have any religion. My grandparents were not believers either. So, you know, all this that you believe is all rather alien to me. I really don't understand it. And furthermore, in my work, I'm a scientist, and so I don't really see any need for it. But I know that this young lady that I like, that she's very religious, and so I want to be well informed, so maybe you can tell me what I need to know. And so I was happy to share some things about the Catholic faith with him, but at the end of the conversation I said, you know, can you tell me why you love this girl above every other girl? She's not the prettiest in the world, she's not the richest, and she's not the smartest, but yet you've picked her above everyone else. So can you tell me really what is the reason that you love her above all? And he said he really couldn't explain why. I said, aha, such is the relationship that we have with our God. He has chosen to love us. We love him, we feel attracted, and we understand that he loves us. We feel this. And it's this belief which draws us in to the desire for deeper union. So the church we can describe as an intimate union uh, like the marriage union the union between husband and wife. In uh, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the fifth chapter, you know, he tells us that's the, when they read it on Sunday, that's when all the ladies in the church kind of rankle because it's, you know, wives be submissive to your husbands. But then right after that, we must pay attention to the most important part of that reading, which says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for the church. So we need only look at the crucifix to see what uh, is called for if we're to love uh, the church uh, as Christ did, if we're to love, if a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, we look at the crucifix, which shows us the total self-gift, the total gift of love that uh, really is part of the church. It defines it, it's a characteristic of it, um, the mystical union that we celebrate uh, in being members of the church. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. So we mentioned that the church is like sacraments in many ways. The church is the universal sacrament of salvation, because it is through the church that the visible signs of God's 
grace are made manifest. So uh, in Latin, uh, the word sacrament uh, in Eng uh, that we use in English in Latin would be sacramentum, which is a translation of the Greek word mysterion. So we go back to this concept of mystery, something that's made manifest in our world, which is beyond our total human comprehension, though we do seek to understand much of it. It's faith-seeking understanding, uh, as St. Anselm uh, gives us. So the church is a universal sacrament of salvation because really, in a practical way, those people who seek God and feel attracted to Him, how are they going to encounter Him in the world? Our God is not a God who hides and who plays games and who has this sort of nature. He's a God that makes Himself present in a wonderful way. And so He has given us the church. He has given us the sacraments. He has given us in abundance His life of grace. His own divine life he shares with his people. If we speak about the church as a universal sacrament of salvation, we also have to uh, understand that in every place and in every condition of the human person, God reaches out. So regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of any other condition that the human person might find himself in, we understand that God means to bring us together in communion. And so it's in the church that this takes place. So also in this way, the church is a universal sacrament of salvation. Another way we can think about the church is uh, in reference to the idea of the people of God. As I mentioned, God chose a certain people in a certain time, in a certain place, the people of Israel. We see this throughout the scriptures. And then that inheritance that the people of Israel received, uh, you know, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that inheritance has now been given to all those who call upon the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as their, as their Lord, uh, all who believe in Him. So the church gathers a people together. And the people is gathered through membership. We uh, are members of the body of Christ. We're incorporated into this body through baptism. Um, and as members of the body, we all recognize that Jesus is the head. He is the head and we are the members. And together we form his people. So his presence is made manifest in his people. And the different members have obligations to one another um, and responsibilities for one another. And so again, it comes to uh, speak about this concept of communion that we have with God and with our neighbor. The Lord told us, he said, you know, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we are formed into a people based on these principles. The uh, idea of the people of God helps us to understand, too, what are our obligations? Uh, in the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament through which we are made members of the church, uh, there is an anointing that's done with the sacred chrism uh, that the bishop consecrates uh, in Holy Week. Uh, the child or the adult is uh, anointed with this chrism, the crown of the head, three times. And the prayer that's used at that time makes mention of three um, characteristics of the member of the body of Christ, that the Christian is priest, prophet, and king. That these three duties, the duties of the priest, the duties of the prophet, and the duties of the king, pertain to every Christian. And so the priestly role is that of sanctification. The priest's job is to make the things of this world holy, to bless and to sanctify. To bless and to sanctify the things of this world with an orientation towards the next world, leading people to the kingdom of heaven. Every Christian has this priestly role because we are called to sanctify the world by the way in which we live our lives, by the way in which we interact with one another, by the way in which we strive for holiness. Every Christian, too, is also a prophet. The job of the prophet was always to speak the truth, to speak God's word, the truth, in charity, 
for the edification and for the salvation of God's people. So each one of us, uh, as a Christian, we're called to speak this word, to proclaim the word, to proclaim Christ, the word made flesh, in the world in which we live. And then we have the kingly office. Uh, the responsibility of the king always was to take care of those people who were the most vulnerable, the weakest in the society. The king was their patron. It was the king who could reach out and to bless those people who could not uh, obtain what they needed. It was all good things came from the hand of the king. So every Christian also has this office, the office to take care of those in the society who have no one else to take care of them. So in this way, the people of God is formed into a priestly people, a prophetic people, and a kingly people. And so these are other characteristics that help us to understand the depth of what it means to be a member of the people of God. So we come to understand the church also as the body of Christ. It's interesting, in the Greek language there uh, is this word soma, which means body, uh, but then there's also another word which is sarx, which means flesh. And we can see, even in English, the difference between these two words. Um, the idea of the body is a little bit more cerebral. It's a little bit, it's an idea that's a little bit more beautiful, the idea of the body. Uh, the idea of the flesh is very real. We think of flesh, we think of, you know, just a piece of meat or something like that, we think of flesh. Um, but really, the body of Christ is made up of its members. There is a very real quality to this. We are members of the body of Christ. And then Christ's body is made manifest to us in the sacraments. Uh, but above all, Christ's body is a communion. It is a communion. It is a participation. Again, it's a relationship that is transcending this world. Uh, it is a relationship that calls us to a certain way of life. Christ's body, when we speak of it, is uh, one body. One body, one spirit in Christ, as the Third Eucharistic Prayer tells us. Um, and if we focus on the idea of this one body, we uh, call to mind what the Lord says in the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, where he desires that they all might be one. He wants all the members of the body to understand their unity. The unity of the body of Christ, the unity of its members, is the base for our communion. And the unity that we experience does not eradicate, it's not uniformity. We have people who are really from diverse backgrounds um, in the body of Christ. But it's this one common characteristic that binds us all together, that leads us forward, that helps us to understand our truest nature as members of the one body of Christ. St. Paul tells us in his first letter to the Corinthians that if any member of the body of Christ suffers, all the members suffer. If any member is honored, all the members are honored. This is a key concept in our understanding uh, the life of the church and what the church is. The way that I like to describe this is when one penitent goes to make an individual confession to tell their sins to the priest behind the closed door of the confessional, when this takes place, every Christian in the world is healed because of the actions of one of the members. As one of the members is healed, so are all the members healed. And the same is true when one member makes a Holy Communion. When we go to Holy Communion worthily and we receive the body of the Lord, we are strengthened individually, but also as the body of Christ. So that's why our obligations, our responsibilities as members of the church are so important. It's not our personal club. It's not our personal place of uh, individual spiritual advancement. We have to move forward as a people. And St. Paul really talks about this uh, uh, when he talks about if one member is honored, all the members are honored. 
The same is true, of course, of our sinfulness. Should we sin, all the members suffer. I always used to tell the kids when I taught uh, in high school, when I taught moral theology, that you know our sinfulness is kind of like smoking a whole pack of cigarettes before you go to run track. I said it's going to diminish your capacity to finish the race. So our sinfulness also, too, diminishes what we are able to do for the whole body of Christ, to build it up, to be a good member of the church that God has asked us to be. One of the beautiful characteristics of the church is that in its very nature, it triumphs all human divisions. Uh, St. Paul tells us there is neither slave nor free, no, nor Jew, nor Greek, that there aren't any divisions that we experience in this world uh, that exist in the church because we have this common purpose. Uh, and it's interesting, the Catholic Church, the word Catholic itself means universal, so in every corner of the world there are people from such diverse backgrounds, but the source of unity that they find in the church is really what Christ desires for his people, that they might all be one. So if we are the members of the body of Christ, and if one member is honored, all are honored. If one member is diminished, all are diminished. Who is our head? Who do we follow? So of course, Christ is the head of the body, and he provides the unity uh, that we need. We look to him. We look to Christ as our head in order to obtain uh, the direction that we need. Even the architecture of our church manifests this. As we all face the altar, uh, we look to Christ, our head. Rather, in many traditional churches, the church is shaped like a ship. We even call the main body of the church the nave, which is a word that comes uh, from a Latin word describing a ship. So we are sailing in the same direction, and we're sailing in direction of the crucifix. We're sailing in the direction of Christ's total gift of self, who is our head. He is really our captain. He's our orientation. He is the star on the horizon that leads us to God the Father. In the life of the church, there's a lot of spousal imagery. We read throughout the Old Testament uh, different um, uh, accounts of Israel as a bride. Uh, we even find accounts of Israel as a prostitute, as an unfaithful wife. But the church uh, is the bride of Christ. Christ has espoused himself to us. Um, a wonderful bishop uh, gave a priest retreat a few years ago, and at the priest retreat, he told us that it was at the Last Supper that Christ betrothed himself to his people. And it was on the Holy Cross, in his crucifixion, that this betrothal was consummated. So he is our groom. He is our spouse. The church is the bride of Christ. And this spousal imagery helps us to understand a little bit more of the imagery, the mystery of what the church is. Um, the sacrament of holy matrimony, as we celebrate it, takes its identity from Christ's love for the church, not vice versa. So we see in Christ's love for the church the love that is to exist between husband and wife manifest in the sacrament of matrimony. But it was first manifest in God's love for us. He first loved us, and so now we respond to him, and it's through the life of the church that we respond to him uh, as his bride. So the church is also understood as the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a principle of unity. So uh, the Holy Spirit is a principle of love that brings together diverse people, diverse places. And so the Holy Spirit is at work in the life of the church in all things. So we see uh, that the Holy Spirit's actions in the church are made manifest through what we call charisms. Charisms are those special gifts that individuals receive from God. And these special gifts that individuals receive are used to build up the church, either directly or indirectly, to add to this community of believers, people that have a common purpose. 
the charisms of the Holy Spirit, these gifts of the Holy Spirit that we receive, they are never ever uh, to be used uh, for one's own personal gain. They are for the life of the whole church. And when we receive these gifts uh, through discernment, through prayer, uh, then we submit them to the church for its uh, growth. Uh, the shepherds of the church, our bishops and priests, and we submit these things um, to them, to their guidance and wisdom, so that as representatives of Christ the head, they can help us use these gifts to build up the whole church and make it a richer and more full uh, expression of God's love for his people. When we say the Nicene Creed, we profess that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. These are four words that are used to describe the life of the church. So um, this helps us to understand a little bit about what the church is. So we might take these one at a time and look at them a little bit more carefully. The creed tells us that the church is one. And of course, that's a principle of unity. We know that Christianity throughout the world has been uh, sadly fractured um, through schism, through heresy, through all sorts of things that have uh, driven wedges between God's people and their ability to be together as one church. But the reason that the church is meant to be one, we can describe in terms of its origin. It comes from God, who is one. Its founder, Jesus Christ, who explicitly said that he desired that his followers be one, as he was one with his Father in doing his Father's will. They were of one will. So the church in this way is a principle of unity. And so our work, our efforts as a community are to strive for this unity of purpose, that we are one church. We also understand the church is one because we profess one faith. As we say the creed on Sundays, the Eucharistic creed, which is the Nicene Creed, or often when people begin to pray the rosary, they'll pray the Apostles' Creed. Sometimes during the Easter season, the Apostles' Creed is prayed in church. Because we profess one faith, we are um, professing our belief that the church should be one as well. We also profess our belief that the church is one in the way in which we worship. One can travel all throughout the world. It doesn't matter what country, what language. If one goes to Mass, one will recognize that it is the same act of worship that is offered in one's own hometown. Um, we worship the same way because we profess the same belief. We have this unity among uh, the members of the church. We also um, understand our unity in terms of um, our church's governance. We are governed by the successors of the apostles, people that receive the one faith, and through the centuries, really now for more than two millennia, this one faith has been consistently professed by all those who have received um, holy orders uh, as bishops, as successors of the apostles, the fullness of the priesthood, so that we can continue to receive this one faith that has come to us from Christ himself. The unity of the church has a lot to do with the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. The soul of the church is one. The soul of the church cannot be divided. It's impossible for us to understand division in the soul. When we talk about the church's unity, we talk about it as the source of fullness as far as the revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the world. In the eighth chapter of the document Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council, the Council Fathers uh, used the formulation that the Church of Christ subsists in the Holy Roman Catholic Church, which means that this fullness exists there, and this fullness is a sign of unity as well that there are ways and elements in which the church can be present in other places, but in the Catholic Church, it is present in its fullness. So there are many things, though, as we all know, that wound the unity of the church throughout the world. 
um, our church, um, the common faith that we profess, uh, can be a source of consolation for us. But what are the things that might divide us? You know, we've said, you know, heresy, which is um, to uh, hold an opinion that is not borne out by revelation or scripture. Apostasy, which is to reject the teachings uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ outright. And then schism, which is to consciously divide oneself, to separate oneself from the unity uh, and the wholeness of the church. These are things that divide us. Uh, these are, of course, as a result of our human weakness. Um, the human person in his weakness oftentimes seeks for his own will rather than to submit himself to the will of the Father. As our Lord so perfectly exemplified for us in his um, going to the cross for our salvation, to follow the will of his Father perfectly. But in a wonderful way, the Lord gives us the grace and the ability to move towards unity in so many ways. The idea that we will uh, B1 is something that we describe as ecumenism, uh, the dialogue between different types of Christians so that uh, we can begin to understand our common uh, purpose as Christians, uh, the many things that we have in common uh, to continue in this dialogue. I remember so well the beautiful image that was given to me about ecumenism uh, in the seminary, our professor described it as we begin with teacup ecumenism. When we encounter people uh, of the Christian faith who have different ideas and opinions, we dialogue about these as we would dialogue over the tea table, not with a polemic, not with shouting, not with hammering one another with different points, but with a caring and polite and listening conversation as we would share at a meal or anything like that. You know, I always like that idea of the teacup ecumenism, where we can bring our different points to the table, but with great love for the other person, we can share our beliefs and our, um, our, our truth that we want to make manifest, and with mutual respect, can together move towards this unity. The church is holy. So we said the church is one, the church is also holy. And this holiness comes from the author of the church, the founder of the church, the person of our Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, their holiness, the love of the Trinity, the fact that the church is born out of the love of God as manifest in the Holy Trinity, this gives it its holiness. And in as much as it is holy, it is something that we all, in our heart of hearts desire because of the truth, the beauty, and the goodness that's made manifest in the life of the church. So we seek this holiness for ourselves. And as members, we participate in this life of holiness. And it's incumbent on us as members of the church to seek holiness individually so that together as a church, as a unity of members, we might be able to present ourselves as an acceptable sacrifice to the Father. A holy church may manifest through its holy people. The church also counts among its members many holy people. The communion of saints, the first of whom is the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, her holiness, the holiness of those people who have struggled against temptation and have won and are in the kingdom of heaven and are examples to us. This gives us hope. Uh, that we too can have this um, same reward uh, to be in the kingdom of heaven, that this idea of holiness is not something that's so totally other that we could never obtain it in our own lives. It is for each one of us the universal call to holiness. This is part of our work as a member of the church. So we've said one, holy, and now we describe the church as Catholic. Of course, this is the name out on the signpost outside the church. This is the Catholic church. But what does Catholic mean? The Greek root of the word Catholic means universal. It's a church that extends to all places and all conditions of the human person. There is not a human person that is not called to be a member of the church. 
For this reason, our church is Catholic. This is a very important point. Um, in all places and in all times, the church is made manifest to bring God's love to his people. The church is uh, universal. Uh, it is universal in its call to lead individuals to salvation. It's universal in its ability to bring grace to those who desire it, who seek it, all people of goodwill. So in this way, the church is um, an instrument that no matter where one goes, one can encounter uh, the universality of the church, even in the local church, as well as the church throughout the world. In one's own home parish, the church is still Catholic. When one goes to Rome, the church is still Catholic. So that even in its diversity, it maintains this unity, this universality. So in this way, the church is Catholic. Because the Roman Catholic Church calls every human person into membership, um, there is a way in which we can understand that uh, every human person shares in some degree membership, at least in its potentiality. But also, those who are members of the Catholic Church are those who have been baptized um, in the Catholic Church. All baptized Christians, regardless of what denomination, if they're validly baptized, share in some way in the membership of the Catholic Church. You know, it's interesting, the Catholic Church does not rebaptize Christians who are baptized in other faith traditions. Those baptisms are understood to be valid. And so, in this way, the Church reaches out to call every human person into unity, into the life of the Church, and into the grace that God wishes for His people. In the same way that um, even those people who are not Catholics, but who are baptized Christians, share in some way in membership in the Christian Church, those who are non-Christians have some level of sharing in what God is doing to bring him, His people to Himself. First among those people who share uh, things with uh, Christians and with Catholics, certainly, are those of the Jewish religion. We share a common faith ancestry. We share the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We share the idea of the Messiah, and the Messiah, of course, who Christians find in the person of Jesus himself. But our Jewish brothers and sisters in the world um, help us to understand the origins, the, um, the way in which the Lord has worked in time and in history to make his revelation known to his people. Pope St. John XXIII um, was uh, known to have said on several occasions that spiritually all Christians are Semitic because the origins of our spirituality are to be found in the experience of the Jewish people. And so in this way, we share many things with those who are uh, uh, members of the Jewish religion. With, with our uh, brothers and sisters of the Muslim faith, we share the common belief in the one God. We share the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we also share with them uh, a great desire to reach out into the world to do works of charity and mercy for those who are in need. And then for those people who are um, members of non-Christian religions uh, throughout the world, we also too must recognize the common desire for the good, uh, the, the, the striving and the searching for God, uh, as the Catechism tells us, amidst, sometimes amidst shadows and signs. You know, but this search for God is something that we cannot ignore as a common bond, and it becomes for us a foothold for dialogue and then for the proclamation of the gospel. In an ancient formulation, it was said that outside of the church there is no salvation. But perhaps it might be better for us to consider uh, that same idea, but in a more positive formulation, which is to say that all salvation flows forth from the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can say that the fullness of Christ's revelation subsists in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. But 
in some way. Uh, the presence of Christ is to be found uh, even outside of the visible confines of the church. Sometimes in the liturgical practices of another uh, Christian denomination, in their proclamation of the word, uh, in the acts of charity that they offer, um, these things are ways in which you know, there is some presence uh, of the church uh, that is made manifest, but we must understand that all salvation that exists in the world, that's the promise of salvation, comes from Christ himself. It, for those people who do not share the Christian religion, uh, we understand that um, those who seek to do God's will, they certainly are people who God recognizes as his own, and he calls them to be with himself. Uh, he grants salvation to those who know th through no fault of their own uh, do not know him, but yet seek him uh, in their lives. We also, too, acknowledge that, um, that many people who, um, who have um, their own religious traditions also, too, share in the desire for good for God's people, and in this way they are pleasing to God. Really, we can say that the only time that salvation is in question is when someone actively knowing that Christ is the author of salvation rejects him with a free act of the will. And in this way, through rejecting Christ with the knowledge that he is the author and source of all salvation, one uh, puts oneself in a very difficult position. And so in this way, we also trust, though, that God reaches out to his people in the depths of their hearts so that they might know him and receive the grace and the love that he wishes for them. At the very end of Matthew's Gospel, he tells us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And our Lord tells us that we should teach uh, what he has taught. And so in this way we find the great missionary mandate of our Lord. And this is an essential characteristic of the church. The church is missionary. It must go out. It can't stay within the visible confines of the church building. Uh, it must go out into the world to be made manifest in a wonderful way in the lives of the poor through acts of charity, uh, by educating those who uh, are ignorant, by reaching out to those uh, who are in need, have clothes, reaching out to the imprisoned, reaching out to all those who are struggling in the world to make the gospel of Christ present in his love and in his mercy. So we've said that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and now apostolic. So the church is um, based on the witness of the apostles. The apostles were those who were sent out by the Lord to carry his word. We know that the apostles lived with the Lord for three years. They traveled with him in Galilee and in Judea. And as they journeyed with the Lord, they learned so many things from him, things that may not be contained even in the sacred scriptures. We read in the last chapter, the last verse actually, of the Gospel of John that um, John tells us that these and many other things uh, did the Lord Jesus. And I suppose were they all to be written, the whole world could not contain the books. So we understand that the apostles had a privileged witness of God's grace. So in this way, the church is apostolic in its origin. The Lord chose these 12 apostles to be his witnesses, to be those who would go out and bring this word into the world. So it's apostolic in its origin. It's also apostolic in its teaching, based on what I said, in the fact that the apostles are able to bring the teaching that they receive from the Lord himself into the world. But the church is also apostolic in its structure. The successors of the apostles, our bishops, continue to teach the same truth that the apostles learned from the Lord Jesus. So in this way, the church is apostolic in its origin, it's apostolic in its teaching, and it's apostolic in its structure. When we talk about the church being apostolic, we also talk about 
the work of the apostolate. The work of the apostolate is the work of those Christians who go out into the world to bring the faith to those who seek it, to touch the lives of those who um, are looking for the Lord and to make Christ manifest in the world. So this is the work of the apostles. It's made manifest not only in the work of the bishops, the successors of the apostles, but in the work of every Christian, every Christian who is called to embrace some type of apostolate in the world in which we live.